Atheist Nomads episode 97, Idaho Atheists with Susan Harrington. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, atheist nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 40. 26, 27, yeah. 40. <laughs> We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. It's episode number 97. I am Dustin. Joining me, as always, is Wesley. We're getting really close to a, a number that really doesn't mean much in the scheme of things. <laughs> <laughs> hey, to get into to triple digits when you've got a, a base 10 numbering system, it, 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 you know, it's important. <laughs> Most podcasts don't make it that far. This is so true. Wow. Yeah. Just yeah. Suck it. We wow. will finally be in the, the, the realm of podcasts that are experienced and uh, likely to not be going anywhere. Experienced and still broke. What's up with that, guys? Come on. <laughs> and uh, joining us today is Susan Harrington. Susan is a longtime uh, secular activist here in the Boise area. She's been involved with Idaho Atheists uh, for since what, 1998? <laughs> yeah, 98, I think. Yeah, yeah. so a really <laughs> long time. She's done a lot of the early fights for separation of church and state here in Idaho and just advancing the, the secular community. Uh, she's also a professional educator and has a pretty awesome background there that we'll have some fun discussing. So, Susan, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've actually been wanting to get you on the show for, for a while now. Just uh, we finally got the, the timing right for it. Yes, yes. It worked out well. Yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and, and start off with uh, you know, how did you first get involved with the, the secular community? Oh, well... Um... I think that would have been, I was uh, listening to a sh uh, the news and saw a man being highlighted in a news story having, having to do with uh, Ten Commandments on either the Nampa or Caldwell City Hall, and, and he at the time was American Atheist uh, Idaho State Director, and it just caught my ear, and then I wrote to American Atheist and became a member and then met up with him, and he was kind of exiting the scene, and so uh, he wanted to start an Idaho Atheist. So that's how it started, is just a, a meeting with Daniel, and then he he went a, a different direction, and then and I started the Idaho Atheists going, and and so it was really that one little tiny news blip that that I think got me going. It's like, hey, you know, he's he's taking an active role. He's speaking out, saying this is wrong. You know, separation of state of church is being breached. And so just from that one little, you know, I don't know, 30 second news yeah. <laughs> item is, is I think what, what perked my ears up and got me going. So that's all it takes. <laughs> that is such an awesome, uh, you know, just seeing the butterfly flap its wings and starting a tornado. That's just amazing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for those of you that aren't aware, Nampa and Caldwell are in, in Canyon County. They're, uh, Nampa is about 20 miles from, from Boise, Caldwell about. 35 miles and uh they are for being in a metro area very very conservative uh might i add that that's in the state of idaho yes <laughs> in the state of idaho yeah. <laughs> boise's like this this little liberal flower in the middle of well the desert which actually is pretty apt for this area since it is desert <laughs> i think the only other uh little tiny spot in idaho might be the Sun Valley, Haley, Ketchum area that has some thinkers up there. <laughs> yeah, there. So, so that that's kind of like uh, Seattle with the whole 
you know, Seattle will be in the liberal spot. Yeah. Like the western side and everything else is really yep. red. Yeah. the same idea. Yep. Wow. Yeah, except the red starts as soon as you get out of the city limits. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like Seattle where the suburbs are still pretty liberal. Uh, hmm. Here it's, yeah, the suburbs Actually, the are, north end of Boise is kind of the, the red, the, the one place where the red doesn't invade. Yeah. And actually, the the bench has been becoming a lot more. That's only because liberal. you moved up here, <laughs> Dustin. I do not get credit for that. <laughs> uh, okay, so how did the, the the early years of of Idaho atheists uh, work out? Because most of us, uh, at least that are are actively involved in the atheist community, are know how it works in the the age of Meetup and Facebook. Uh, not mm-hmm. necessarily how it worked before that, the, the Dark Ages. Good question. Um, well, it's it was very old school, I guess. Now that I think about it, uh, we uh, we started having meetings and following Robert's rules of order very professionally. We we did a newsletter, a hard copy newsletter that we mailed out, what? and yeah, and and we had meetings uh, actually at the upstairs of the the Flicks here in town, and um, they had to have a meeting room. I believe the humanists still meet there, mm-hmm. and. Um, so very face to face and and paper copy, yeah. And so, and and honestly, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you, you have a passion, you have a drive. You know, things aren't right, but we got caught off guard. I don't know if you want me to tell that story or yeah, not, but yeah, please do. The first thing, you know, aside from these meetings, we uh, we did the we started the highway cleanup, and that was a volunteer activity because we wanted our members to have volunteer and social. And then also the activist part of the opportunity to, you know, be active in whatever they wanted to do. So it's interesting. From my American Atheist connections, there was a, a man named Rob Sherman who wanted to come to, to Boise to, to speak. And I, okay, fine. And then at some point he asked, or I brought up, the Table Rock Cross. And I did not know what a firestorm it would cause because Rob was very uh, capable as far as alerting the media. And, you know, I was so naive. And and he kind of, uh, he came to town, gave a speech at, at BSU and and brought up the Table Rock Cross. And, and he knew more about it as far as how to get the media's attention. So he just said some statements and, oh my gosh, the entire town went crazy thinking that we were going to file a lawsuit, which one had already been filed at ACLU a few years earlier, so everyone was scared, and the the news <laughs> eventually at one point said that 10,000 people were walking through Boise to save the cross, and interesting enough, heading the, the parade was uh, our former state senator, or U- U.S. Senator Larry Craig, so that's kind of oh, nice. interesting. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, Larry <laughs> Craig, famous for uh, sucking cocks in the Minnesota or Minneapolis airport. Yes, yes. That's that guy. Yeah, awesome. yeah. And he he had he had pushed so much for anti-gay uh, legislation, and then come to find out, you know, he was a hypocrite. So yeah, he he was a self-hating closet case. <laughs> yeah, so, but that that's what started our our initiation into yeah. the scene and it, it was a whirlwind and and I was certainly not expecting it but you know we, we we didn't file a lawsuit but we did find out and this is interesting and I do want to make sure that this stays um, in the public knowledge is that uh, the ACLU um, at that time uh, Jack Van Valkenburg was the director and, and he invited us in to make copies of in, any of his files that he had from a 1995 case, I believe, that someone had filed and hadn't gone anywhere. But he actually had the transcript from when the little tiny plot of land was sold underneath the cross. This is after a case in Eugene, Oregon, that uh, someone had filed where they, they won because you know the cross; these crosses were built on public land, and then when they were threatened, they would quietly be sold. To private hands, and and so he had the actual transcript. And and sad to say, someone that I I do like is uh, Governor Cecil Andrus was involved. But the transcript clearly shows that it was pretty much a sham sale, just to protect the cross, to get it out of the public realm into the private. And so that's interesting. And and someday maybe maybe someone will have the funds to actually file a lawsuit and 
and uh, do something about that. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if it's too late or not. It's if you look at the the recent precedent on stuff like that, if it was an illegal sale decades mm-hmm. ago, the likelihood of that being reversed is really slim. If it's a recent, maybe if it's still mm-hmm. on government land, right? Then it's right. a lot more likely. Like the the Mount Soledad, yeah, in California. Yeah, I've been watching that over the years. But. And and for those of you that aren't aren't aware about the the Table Rock Cross, uh, just to the east of Boise is Table Rock. It's uh, part of the foothills, and there is a cross that's right on the face of it. Uh, it's pretty big. And, and light it up. And- <laughs> yeah, and a couple years ago, they actually uh, turned off the lights on it for upgrades. And I had blogged about it once and actually got an email from somebody wanting to you know, what happened to the cross? Is it gone? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it was Madeline Murray O'Hare. <laughs> I was so excited because that's a huge eyesore in the view from my backyard is this giant lit cross. And no, they were just upgrading it to LEDs. Uh, oh, cut great. Down the, now it's brighter. Yeah, it's about four or five times brighter and it uses <laughs> a tenth as much electricity. Well, that, that's a good. I mean, at least they're being energy efficient. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it's it's on it's something like ten <laughs> square feet of private land. The rest is all state owned. Yeah, and I I went up there and and tried to you know look up at the cross arms and see. I wonder if they overhang the amount on the ground. And then I also was trying to trace electrical lines to see. Well, I wonder if there's any way they're tied back to where the city might be paying for that electricity to light it up. But I don't know. So just, it, it, it's a <laughs> it's a island of private property inside a city property. Oh yeah, it's just a little tiny bit that they sold off in a supposed auction, but it was really an illegal land sale. And now it's in private hands, little tiny square under the cross. <laughs> yeah, I, I would. What I would really like to see at some point is somebody go back and say, okay, all of those deals like that were invalid. And that you cannot mm-hmm. have private land less than, say, an acre that's surrounded by public land. Because if it's less than an acre, it, it was probably illegal in the first and, place. And done, yeah, the intent was to protect the religious. You know, and, and these are all, all over the country. It was at the Fraternity of Eagles during the, I don't know, the Charlton Heston Ten Commandment movie is when the mm-hmm. Fraternity of Eagles handed these out in the 50s, handed them out all over the country. And... And then, you know, if they were on public land and got challenged and they were quietly and quickly switched over to private land. And I, I, knew, I do know there's a, an, okay, that's uh, another Ten Commandments. Oh, that's the Ten Commandments I'm talking about. Yeah, not the cross. That's mm. a whole other story, a Ten Commandments story. And we had one here <laughs> at Julia Davis Park that did get taken out. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, so I switched on you. I switched from the cross <laughs> to the Ten Commandments. There was just so many instances that, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. And it's shifting back to the, the, the development of the, the organization. Okay. Um, how did you find new members or how did members find people who wanted to be members? Oh, find you? yeah. Yeah. Um, well, like I s- said, it's, it was old school. And so one of the ways is letters to the editor. It's interesting writing letters to the editor and old fashioned paper phone books. <laughs> you know, this is almost before email, or about the time email was started. In fact, when I first started, I got an email that was at atheist at, at micron.net, I believe. That was way back when, way wow. back when. But um, so, yeah, people would write letters to the editor, and if it was, you know, if you could see that, that you had like thoughts on this separation of state and church, then you'd pick up the phone book, you'd call that person because you didn't have an address, but you'd have a name. And you'd, wow. yeah, that's how a lot of people got in contact. And isn't that interesting? It's just weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Newspapers, phone books, and landlines. <laughs> yeah. And, and word of mouth, you know, three people things would, I don't ever use anymore. Yeah. It's outdated. <laughs> and right now, that, that feels like it must have been, you know, decades ago. No, it <laughs> actually, 1998. <laughs> that's not that okay, long. Okay. Okay. Now, don't be bringing up age here. I'm. Um, <laughs> a little sensitive on that subject, Dustin. Oh, well, but in '98, I'd call people on landlines and use sure. read the newspaper and <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. And then the the news, you know. Yeah, yeah. I've been exclusively cell phone since 
just before 2000. Man. Yeah. Wow. Times have changed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how did the, the, the early days go with, with establishing the community here? Because like one of the things okay. uh, worth uh, mentioning is that Susan was also the founding coordinator for the Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason. She preceded me in that role. Um, so she's been quite the pillar in the, the community here. Yeah, I just get things, I just stir the pot, you know, get things. <laughs> <laughs> so what were the old days like? Um, uh, let me see. Didn't she um, just say to by, not go there? Well. I, and I, by old days, I just mean pre-meetup days. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I have to say it, it, it was, a, I think it, from my perspective, it was a lot, a lot. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Um, I, th- I think we we each felt more isolated. Each of the people, I, I really do, because and and cautious and paranoid. You know, we I, I I would put advertisements in the paper again, the the hard copy newspaper about a meeting, and like I mentioned before at the flicks, and people would show up and and you know uh, some of them I still think were just spies. You know, and and so we we had a feeling of. It was very a lot smaller, and so everyone that showed up, you had to wonder, like, are, are they here for the right reasons? Are they here just to check us out? You know, and you just had to hope that that they weren't going to try to, you know, run the organization to ground, which a few people did. You know, a few mm. people did try to, like, like Idaho Atheists, we one of our former board members, you know, I, I went to a lot of work to get the IRS, you know, and, and all the 501c3 paperwork done under Idaho Atheists, and then a board member wanted to change it and take the atheist word out, you know, change it to something nicer, and I understood that, you know, totally, but I had already gone to all the work, and so and so that was a huge fight, it almost tore us, tore us apart, and um, so there were, I, I think it was, I don't know, I, I think it was scarier, um, yeah. I think you were more isolated and more unsure, and now I feel it's so amazing. I mean, with the meetups and all the work that you're doing, Dustin, and it's just amazing how it seems like um, I think people can go forward with more confidence and get more done because they are more confident, certainly more than I ever was. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad to say, but people are still joining meetups to spy on you. I mean, uh, probably that, yeah. we actually had a reporter come into our our group a couple different times and not tell us anything about himself, you know, not there to write a story or anything. It was just weird. He even brought his wife once. It was just mm. checking you out. Yeah. yeah we've had, uh, Matt slick who uh, we had his daughter on the show, uh, a while back, <laughs> which was interesting. That was a lot of fun. Uh, but he's, he's been, <laughs> you know, Matt slicks a, a really sleazy evangelist. He, he trains a bunch of people in basically how to, weave logical snares that's really all it comes down to he just tries to flub you up and make you look like an idiot does that that sound fair oh yeah and (laughs) he's been at least as long as i've been in the area he's been trying to spy on all the different groups uh he's, he's joined all of them on on meetup and he keeps trying to us into stuff he, and, he, oh, and he har- harasses us at the yeah. like hyde park street fair at our booth he comes over and just to get a crowd which actually helps us in the end mm-hmm. but yeah he comes over and harasses us and like you know go get your own booth matt <laughs> yeah yeah uh, he, he tr- kept trying to to goad west valley free thinkers into sending people to his school to to let his people practice on <laughs> and kept talking about wanting to join our, our meetings and, and come and talk to us. And he never actually did. And then a couple of months ago, he came to Idaho Atheists, uh, meet an atheist and had one of his students with them. And they started out just very nice. I talked to him for quite a bit and kept it friendly. And by the end of the night, he was really making people mad. <laughs> This is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but one of the people he made mad is uh, Ken, uh, who's gay. And one of the early statements they'd made was about, you know, something anti-gay rights. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you make stuff statements like that, and 
he did not do a good job of justifying them from any kind of a rational sense and why it should be in the laws. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, Matt's, Matt Slick's got Carm and all that, but I think of him as kind of bigger than that. And he's just pulling a Ray Comfort or, you know, just some actual really big evangelist and going out on the street fairs. I, I, I just always thought that he would, that would be beneath him somehow. That's what he wants people to think of him. Huh. But best right, I can well, tell, I'm buying into his bullshit. Not best bad. I can tell, he's just this pathetic little man with way too high of an opinion of himself. A little pathetic guy with a website. Yeah, and a radio huh. program. We, we did a we did a debate with Eddie Tabish, who's a constitutional attorney in California, and Matt Slick and. I think everyone, well, pretty much everyone in the room would would say I think that Eddie won the debate, but not Matt. He thinks he won it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we had uh, Dan Barker coming uh, last year, and he was supposed to be debating. uh, Matt Slick had agreed to come, and then a week before the debate, backed out. Ooh. (laughs) So we had to pull in, find somebody else to debate him, and we ended up getting some campus minister at BSU. Oh, no. Who... <laughs> Dan Barker probably chewed up. <laughs> yeah. He had... That's kind of sad. But... It, it was sad. He, yeah, this guy got a little bit of practice, but he did not know how to do a debate. Well, good on the guy for at least giving it a, a good try. Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Nobody else would re- would present the, the Christian perspective, so he felt like he had to. <laughs> you can't fault him for that. <laughs> no, yeah. I would have bought him a beer after that. Yeah. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Tweet us at atheistnomads. Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, you've also had quite a few awesome roles you've gotten to play with uh, education in the state. Because when people think of Idaho, uh, what everybody thinks is right-wing, very conservative schools. They're not going to talk about evolution or anything like that. Um, But you actually had a, a pretty big role to play with that. You know... Being in the right place at the right time really does matter. And I, I ha- for the evolution debate, I happen to be in the right place at the right time. Um, I'm still wondering if they're actually teaching evolution in the, around the state, but they're uh, supposed to. My niece, uh, her biology class at, at at her school to the west of Boise, her favorite part of the biology class was the evolution sec- segment. And they they teach it, even in small little farming towns. Well, if if the state's doing its job right, they're all they're being tested on it. So hopefully they're teaching it because that wouldn't be fair to students. Yeah. You know? So so what role were you you in at well, that time? Well, I just I I happen to be working at the Idaho State Department of Education as the math science coordinator, and um, this is when the whole debate came up. And um, so I I was in committee meetings, and at the time, and one of my first first memories uh, actually, and Fox. Um, was the superintendent of public instruction very right wing, and I don't think she knew who I was when she hired me. But um, <laughs> a, but uh, actually, in one committee meeting, I remember um, someone speaking up and, and saying, "Well, you know, Doctor Fox doesn't want this," and and I just kept sticking to my guns, you know, as far as this is the fu- fundamental concept of biology. You know, how, how can you teach anything about biology without this? And and there was other people on the committee that agreed and that were strong, too. And so, um, it, you know, it's interesting, you know, and, and Anne Fox is one that believed in aliens, actually, and, um, and, and talked about that, too. And so, it, you know, it was a very scary time because it could have gone the other way. And, and then she did leave office, and then uh, Dr. Merlin Howard came into office, which is, she was much more rational-minded. And um, still, the debate went on for years and back and forth and back and forth. And luckily, we just have enough uh, rational people, scientifically minded people in this state who did speak up. 
and who kept speaking up as long as it took. And so, and at the same time, I think the Kansas debacle helped because in Kansas they voted not to teach it, and then companies started moving out of the state. And so it all kind of came together. And um, so a lot of people, a lot of people with 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 good information and knowledge stepped up to the plate and testified, and that's what it takes. Because if you don't, then the other side is going to have their say, and, and if you don't counter it, then the legislators are going to vote the other way. So, yeah, that was a scary time, and luckily, I think that was 2001, we passed those state standards that included evolution. Nice. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I again, I, I didn't have that big of a role, but I, it, it was you know, every person played their part to you know you had to have people saying it from many different realms from the scientific realm from the government you know and i kept talking about the separation of state and church as well you know because a lot of people still think that they should be teaching religion in the state which luckily our constitution is pretty strict on on introducing religious uh books and pamphlets so uh, uh, you, you want to go into that um yeah i, I uh um, I think that our constitution was written in the 1890s, and this is when the, the Mormon influence scared a lot of people. So they wrote into our Idaho constitution very strict uh, standards of not introducing any religious tracts or books because they didn't want the Mormons taking over, which, interesting, they kind of have the the whole eastern part of our state. But mm-hmm. um, Yeah, and so it, it is on there. It's on the books, that, and, you know, we, we shouldn't be talking about any which you know i i wouldn't mind maybe a comparative religion class but yeah with our constitution it's an it's a good thing the way it's written i I don't have the exact wording (laughs) off the top of my head but it's um you know just google it and you can see it's it's very strict now uh comparative religions is actually in the curriculum uh for middle school right now oh okay part of middle school social studies so i'm wondering what you know what religious what religions they discuss that that'd be interesting uh so I have twice uh, been a guest speaker for a, a local middle school. And you have uh, a great background for that, too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the first time was just for one class, and I was kind of giving, like, the initial overview. And this year it was for all of the seventh graders at this middle school. So they were cycling through, and I was the day before the final test. <laughs> and they covered what they considered to be the major world religions. So they had to cover Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. Okay. Uh, the kids were really fascinated with animism, which kind of like you can't teach biology without evolution. You can't teach comparative religion without animism and paganism. That's the core of all of them. And oh, so man. I had so much fun covering those oh, parts. Oh, and I, you changed those students' lives, really, and, uh, by broadening their, yeah. uh, their uh, the information they don't get, you know? Yeah, and I uh, awesome. also covered uh, Sikhism, which isn't generally viewed as a major world religion when there's more Sikhs than there are Jews. Interesting. And you could go on and on with the number of religions there are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they're actually moving it from 7th grade to 6th grade now. Oh, cool. <laughs> and it's it was amazing. Like there, there was one question I got from a kid uh, who was asking about Mormons and whether or not they're Christian. <laughs> and what did you say? <laughs> I said, well, um, at, at the most basic level, to qualify as a Christian, you need to believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and Mormons do believe that. Um, there are some Christians who do not view them as Christian, but if you, they're not Protestant or Catholic, but they are Christian. And it's interesting. Their name is, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. So they, they put it in their name, <laughs> but it's still questioned. Yeah. I actually got a, a couple of questions about, about Mormons. Like, are they Christian? Mm-hmm. Where do they fit within all the different branches of Christianity? It's like, yeah, there's their own thing. And uh, it, it was amazing to see these kids, they're, they're, eyes open up to wow it's not just catholics and mormons because <laughs> yep. in a small town like that here it's all catholics and mormons and the easiest easiest way to make a non-believer is to let them see all the religions yep. yeah, yeah it really that's, is 
That's a, with my own kids, you know, I, I never wanted to limit them what they wanted to choose. But all I ask is that they check out lots of different religions. If, you know, if they were interested in becoming religious, I had no problem with that. I'd still love them. But I just asked that one favor. I said, just check out a lot of different religions and pick one that's right for you. And don't just go with whatever one your friends are in. And, you know, needless to say, neither one of them of my children are religious. But it's that, that wasn't the reason I said that. I just wanted them to choose something for them because there's so many people, I think, who are in the religion probably that they were born in. And they probably don't feel it inside, you know, and so religion to me should be a personal matter. And I don't I don't think it is as often as it should be. It's it's Mm -hmm. more of a social or uh, prestige or I I don't know. It's just kind of a (laughs) false, you know, people are just pretending. And that's sad. Yeah. Yeah. If you're born in most places in the U.S. or Europe, okay, some parts of Europe, you're probably going to be Christian Mm -hmm. and the type that happens to be predominant where you're at. If you're born in Iraq, you're probably going to be Muslim. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that interesting? Pure and simple. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. likely to think all the rest are horribly wrong. And just so, so you being in that classroom, Dustin, it, it, that's opening those kids' minds that they have a choice. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, and, and one of the, the things that I find, you know, I've got the educational background to cover those topics, but also being an outsider, I don't have a horse in that race. But you, you also, the perspective of being an insider... As far as the Seventh Day Adventist, yeah. So you have a great background yeah. to talk to these yeah. students. It's it's oh man, so much fun, and because you know most of the teachers probably have are having to be very careful not to discuss their own beliefs, and you know I had to make it clear their teachers had made it clear to them before I got there that they could not ask me about my own beliefs. I made it clear at the start of each class period that I would be describing what some people believe will not be proscribing what you should believe and that I would not answer any questions about what I personally believe. And they, for the most part, did a good job of not trying to find that out because I would have gotten in a lot of trouble if I had just gotten up there and said, all right, all religion is bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I did in one class uh, slip just a little on language well edit that part out i think i said what did i say i think i said it's either crap or damn <laughs> didn't slip that much and everybody was like <gasps> <laughs> i was like oh i'm sorry i'm used to talking to adults <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> i'm sure you made a, a good impression on these students yeah yep well and yeah, you know, with, with the work you did with the the evolution and the biology curriculum, uh, you're still making a, a difference for the students going through well, Idaho schools. Hopefully, I, I hear stories that you know. I hear stories of science teachers presenting it, but then poo pooing it in the same breath. So, and I, I you just don't know. You you hope they're being honorable and and what they're supposed to do. Yeah. But I, it, you know, if, if 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 they are really really religious, then it's probably hard for them because they feel like they're going against their beliefs but <laughs> well but well, one thing if if you're presenting it and you're doing a at least reasonably fair job of presenting the scientific facts even if you poo poo it uh, like i went through my my biggest exposure to evolution early on was at the 7th Avenue Theological Seminary in a class called Issues and Origins it was a two semester hour creationist propaganda class and how did how did you feel when they were presenting it to you? That the creationists have nothing. All they're doing is trying to poke holes in a, a couple little bits. Um, they were only presenting really about a 1970s version of, of evolutionary theory. So it was all about the, the fossil record. And so all they were trying to do was poke holes in the fossil record. Like, oh, this one spot where the, the scientists said it was <laughs> supposed to be 20 million years. No, it was only a few thousand. Well, okay, in that spot... Maybe. Right. Oh, the transitional fossils. That's just one lake in Colorado. That's not <laughs> the whole world. And, the, and you know, it, this reminds me of the, the missing link argument, like, oh, something missing here. Well, um, just the other day they found mm-hmm. something, right? Yeah, fourth hominid species. Yeah, and so it reminds me of that Futurama series where, you know, the, the professor 
or whoever is giving a speech and, and they're trying to poke holes, well, you don't have anything here. And then they find something there. And then they don't have find. Then they say, well, then you don't have anything between that and the one before it. And then they find something there. And they, they keep finding things, but then they keep saying, well, you're missing. And so the, the places we're missing is getting smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. So eventually, yeah. they're going to have to give up that argument. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I came out of a class designed to inoculate me against evolutionary theory and make sure I was a good... Uh, creationist i came out the other end believing evolution was fact yeah so it backfired it totally backfired and so even if these teachers are doing that for a lot of kids the ones who would have not just objected to okay not done like i did when i was a kid and when bill and i the science guy would talk about evolution i would would quietly pray for him oh (laughs) Uh, the kids that aren't doing that are going to be hearing the poo-pooing be like well, that's ridiculous, because the science is so yeah. solid. And, and that's great. Times have changed. You know, when, when I was in high school, I didn't learn evolution in high school. But my parents had a Time Life series. Do you remember those? Mm-hmm. And one of those books was evolution. It was my favorite book, and I just spent hours looking at it. And I don't know <laughs> why, because you know it wasn't ever talked about all that much back then. But I just knew something that was there was fascinating that most adults in my life weren't talking about. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you never know what's going to uh-huh. be the spark for people to question and, and want more information. Yeah. But I think more and more kids are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, our, our listeners have heard you before. Uh, I, I did include the National Day of Reason audio on our, our feed. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about a few years ago when we were in uh, that, Gary's backyard, no, Gary no, and that, backyard. That and, never, that was not usable. I was hoping you didn't use that because... <laughs> it was so not usable. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 because <laughs> we were having a little bit too good of a time. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we had the, the, the steps of the, the Idaho State Capitol uh, this year, um, but you got the steps in 2005. Yeah. Yeah, 10 years ago. Uh, do you want to... Tell us a bit about that. Sure, sure. Um, I'll, I'll back it up. And uh, for for six years prior to that, so starting in 1999, I started writing to the governor um, asking for a proclamation. First starting off with, a, I called it Athe- Atheist Heritage Week because there was a Christian Heritage Week and there's a Christian History Week, too. Kind of redundant to me, but... So I asked for an Atheist Heritage, Drink Pro- Atheist Heritage Week proclamation. And uh, he denied it, and but I, I started keeping track, you know, on the website. That's what's cool about the internet. Um, all the religious proclamations he was issuing out, and not one for atheists. That he did give one, I think, to, for some um, science day at one Idaho Science Day at some point, you know, which is awesome. But I wanted something more for for our community, and I kept being denied for six years. We tried, um, and so. After a while, I started thinking, you know, this is discrimination. It's not haphazard that he's saying no to us and still continuing to hand out, not just Christian, but all different, you know, Hindu and and uh, all different types of religious proclamations, you know, and but no to us. And so he kept doing that for six years. And finally, I was walking by the Capitol building, and it, it just dawned on me. I, I, I wondered if they'd reserved it yet. And so I... I went and reserved the steps um, for what would have been the National Day of Prayer, what you know, that first Thursday in May, and it, they hadn't reserved it yet, so I reserved it, and um, and thought, okay, you know, that they didn't have it, so we're going to take it, and, and we'll make a point here. We'll have our own day, and it um, wasn't much longer than that that I got a phone call from the person that was supposed to have reserved it, but hadn't, and I think he was from the Catholic Church, and he was pretty upset, and you know, I'm, I'm sorry. It's nothing against you. It's it's really against our government officials. You know, I really don't care what you want to celebrate, but I don't want our government officials showing favoritism. And so he he agreed that they would just have theirs inside. And I said, and I said, well, could, could you try to get everyone through by noon because that's when our program is starting on the steps. So you know, he he was upset, but he I think he understood. You know, it was first come first serve. It said that. Well, then the governor's people got involved and and pull strings and and then i got a call from the facilities people saying uh, you can't have it it actually is the the religious people's national day of prayer day and i said well wait it's first come first serve you know i was first and 
they tried to say, yeah, it's a computer glitch, and it was supposed to be theirs, <laughs> a standing reservation or something. And so actually, that was probably the hardest two weeks of my life. One, well, not the hardest, but it was a very hard time because, you know, like I mentioned before, I felt very isolated, and I had to try to, you know, American Atheist said that if you can find an attorney, we'll pay for it. I said, mm. awesome. But the hard part was finding an attorney. I spent two weeks trying to find an attorney that would take the case. And that was the hard part. No one would touch it. Finally, 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 someone took it. Um, Bernie Zahela took it. And agree- And then um, American Atheist also hired uh, a, a, a national person to come help Bernie that had more experience. And, um, oh, uh, oh, boy, R- Randy Teague, I think it was his name. Yeah. So, yeah, that was the hardest part, is just finding an attorney, because we were in the right. I mean, we had uh, past reservations from the religious community that showed they had made their reservation on different days and different months, and so it wasn't a computer, you know, it had nothing to do with a standing, um, consistent reservation. They just made it when they got around to it in the spring. And so um, we had all the information, and and it was hands down. We just needed the attorney. And so when we went to court, it was 4 p.m., the day before we're supposed to have it, so this would have been May 4th, 2005, 4 oh, p.m. Wow. Oh, yeah, I was down on the <laughs> wire. Talk about stress. And the 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 judge um, decided to go in our favor, obviously. He even he had to. The governor's people were on the other side of the table, but uh, uh, George, uh, uh, Judge Windmill um, ruled in our favor. He had to, you know, because it was obvious. It was first come, first serve, and I was first that year. So we got the steps and had a great day, and it rained that day, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but it's important. It's important to not let our government officials show favoritism. Yeah. And, you know, this time around, uh, Gary just, on a whim, decided to check to see if it was available. Mm-hmm. And so he put in his application, and it was available. That is just too funny. Yeah. You would think they would have somebody camped outside of that office on the first day they could register. (laughs) Well, after our our deal in 2005, I had heard that then they were making reservations for the next 10 years. And I don't know how they could unless they changed their first come, first serve policy. But if they did have it for 10 years, well, then Gary stepped in and got it the first Uh, day available. (laughs) The current rules are that you can only reserve the steps... Up to six months in advance. Right. So And it's first come, first serve at that point. So maybe they've had to every every year be first. But I'm I'm glad Gary did what he get did. Apparently they, they slacked off a little bit. Yep. And Gary got in like <laughs> the first day or two he could. That's awesome. Uh, I do happen to know that considering how much work it is, uh yeah, you know, every ten years isn't too terribly bad. No. Oh. Uh no. Oh. If we could keep at least keep that up as kind of a yeah, we're here reminder. Uh, but you know, worst case scenario, there's always the city hall steps. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the steps around the side of the Capitol. There's the rotunda, which this year that's where the uh, National Day of Prayer people were. Yeah. How much does it cost to reserve the stairs? Free. Oh, there you go. Yeah, Should go for that every year. Yeah, it's a <laughs> government. Public building. Mm-hmm. Yep. You, you can even get married under the rotunda. Yeah. Yeah, people do that. <laughs> oh, oh, you did that. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gra- granite, you know, all the way up. <laughs> the, the acoustics in there are horrible, but... <laughs> Still, yeah. that's kind of cool. Yeah, the, the acoustics on awesome the steps pictures. are also pretty bad. Mm. That was fun to clean but up. But hey, but I thought that, <laughs> wasn't there a place you can, st- oh, I don't know if it works in this rotunda where you can stand on one side and if you whisper and then someone on the other side. Something about this is triggering my memory back in the Founding Fathers. Um, was it the, when Philadelphia was the? Uh, no, was, it's, the, it's the current U.S. Was Capitol Was it the current building. one? Right. Yeah, and so you the, can whisper on, on one side and the other side yeah. will hear you. The, the house had their offices in the rotunda at the time. Yeah. And John Quincy Adams, <gasps> who, you former noticed. president then Speaker of the House, and, and yes, he, he was Speaker of the House after he was President. Uh, he had positioned his desk right in the exact spot where you can hear whispering at the desk of the opposition party's leader. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so he would just sit there and listen to everything they were saying. 
I don't think it works the other way. It's just one way. Uh, or he kept really quiet. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah, if you do a tour of the Capitol now, at least at least when when I had that tour, and that would have been ninety eight. Uh, they will have one person stand on the one spot. They've got markers there, and then some other other people at the other side. And then the one person just starts whispering, and you can hear everything. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I hate to say it, but I think they actually talked about that in the, one of those horrible uh, National Treasure movies. <laughs> oh. Uh. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per-episode monthly or even annual basis using paypal or patreon find out more at atheistnomads.com use the links on the right side of the page one dollar an episode is all we ask please think of the kittens so were you uh, raised religious susan uh yeah. no my actually my parents didn't really say anything one way or another and uh, mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm glad they didn't indoctrinate me. Um, I, I heard my dad say maybe one, one for sure, maybe two comments during my childhood, yeah. um, where and, and my mom was raised Catholic, and uh, so she, you know, took us to church on Easter and Christmas, and she showed us how to do the rosemary. But there was uh, the um, what what I say, not rosemary, rosary, <laughs> rosary. <laughs> rosary. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I like rosemary better, but yeah. Um, she there was never any follow up. I mean, she showed it to me once, but she never then mentioned it again. Never asked me if I, you know. And so I really tried to be religious, but I knew my dad wasn't, and you know, not overtly. He never talked about it. I just heard him over. You know, I just overheard him one time. Um, my dad was a geologist and would be, visit these old miners, you know, with their mining claims. And I heard him one time. I was pretty little. He came home and was talking to my mom about this this old miner he'd ran into that was you know, talking about the Lord and have you been saved and all that. And my dad told my mom, um, you know, I, I just told him that, you know, I don't believe any of that Jesus stuff. And he left me alone. And my little ears picked up on that. And, you know, so it was never talked about. But when I overheard that, I thought, okay, not everyone believes. Hmm. So I was lucky. I was lucky that my my dad was an atheist, and my mom, even though she was raised Catholic, uh, she didn't get her her church wedding. And that I've told that story before. Mm. But uh, my dad got in a fight with the, with the priest. My dad called the <laughs> priest a pagan, and my the priest called my dad a heathen or something. And no wedding for my mom. Poor girl. They wow. actually, they actually. This was in Portland, Oregon, and they ended up eloping to pay at Idaho because the <laughs> age was lower in Idaho. Oh, so they yeah. got married over here, spent their wedding night in a cornfield. <laughs> so poor mom. She didn't get her church wedding, but uh, I really am glad that, that I was not indoctrinated and, you know, kind of left to just figure things out. And So she was 16. Uh, no, no. She was, uh, she would have been maybe 18 or 19 it was a year difference and so at least in the early 90s oregon was oh, 17 no, and the, idaho was 16 this wasn't this was in the um 50s <laughs> so then they might have lowered the ages I, they might have changed then. but i know that wow. idaho was one year lower than i'm trying to think i think they were 18 maybe and oregon might have been 19 and so hmm. they just came over here and got married and <laughs> yeah yeah by the time my sister got married it was uh 17 in oregon 16 in idaho so oh, and that was in the 90s that was would have been 90 90 or 91 wow, wow. and so she got married in payette she was 16 <laughs> and pregnant wow well they lowered it then wow. yeah they yeah, still one year different wow okay so yeah and then back then, I remember my parents, they got over here, but they had to have blood tests. You know, that's when they had to make sure they weren't cousins or mm. I don't know what, what wow, they were testing really? for. Yeah. And so they had to actually go to Caldwell Hospital to get the blood test, <laughs> but then went back to pay it to the justice of the peace or whatever. <laughs> Times have changed. We don't do blood tests anymore. Nope. How weird that they didn't trust people enough to not be cousins. <laughs> Yeah, or maybe they were testing for um, syphilis or something in those days. I don't know. In the <laughs> 1950s. 
Huh. Yeah, they probably had the RPR at the time. Uh, that's the standard uh, syphilis screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But but RPR is just a, it's a really broad spectrum test that it, if you have syphilis it will be positive. It can also be positive if, there, if there's something else wrong. Yeah. So it's one with a whole lot of false positives, but it's a cheap, easy to do huh. test. Maybe. So it's still commonly used. Huh. Can't say for sure that it would have been the test they had back then, but I know there as tests have gotten more precise, uh, wider spectrum ones have gotten gone out mm-hmm. of out of style. Like uh, for hepatitis C, for quite a while, uh, ALT testing was the only thing you could do. It's mm-hmm. just looking for a particular liver enzyme. If you have an acute case of hepatitis C, you will have an elevated ALT. Mm. You'll also have an elevated ALT if you have drank too much, say a weekend of binge drinking, if you have psoriasis, or in some cases you can even have it from certain inf- other infections, or uh, I've even seen it with people who have started doing some really intense physical training. That like the the elevated protein levels mm-hmm. in their their blood will uh, cause the liver to panic, and it's it's just an enzyme to show that the liver is panicking. By the time somebody has a positive ALT from hepatitis C, they are they've been infectious for decades. <laughs> <laughs> so now there's actual hepatitis C screening, so you don't have to do that one for that. So now it's just general use for general liver health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, that was some uh, a bit of a yeah. uh, wild tangent. No. no, it's all all good information. <laughs> yeah, man, oh my. it would be so awesome if you could give some tips to, <laughs> to Amber, the the coordinator of of our meetups out here, because she really wants to just keep it private and quiet and just like a little social group. And I've never understood that. Well, it's it's a, it's a risk, you know, like you were talking about your reporter people coming in and you know you do take a risk when you open it up but you have Mm -hmm. to because things don't get done otherwise you want to reach out yeah Mm -hmm. and there's people out there that still to this day i'm amazed when people say i thought i was the only one or i didn't know a group existed you know we get that all the time yeah and you know the our highway cleanup that's it's a sign it's on two sides of the highway and and people come to us from that they see that sign and then they they google and find us that way so that's an idea i, I don't know yeah. if you want have people that want to volunteer as well as social lies well, but we, we actually do do have a uh, trail cleanup and have a sign out there mm. uh, and yeah but that's really the only public thing that we do aside from drinking <laughs> 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 yeah it's you know it also maybe she'll as as she wants other people to start taking over some of the responsibilities. She'll feel the need to open it up for more involvement and people to come in that are might be interested in taking a leadership role. Yeah, yeah. But then you know that's another whole issue. You have to be careful. I felt like you know you never know who wants to take over and what their intentions are. So you do have to be careful. Yeah. You know. Make sure that people are in it for the right reasons, and it's it's it can be fragile. And I don't know. I think that's changing. I th- you know I read reports all the time now where, uh, especially young people are are you know not religious, and so it's I, I think what are we at twenty five percent now non religious the nuns yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. That, so that it's latest one yeah. uh, twenty three from the the latest okay. Pew study. So, you know, I, I think there, there becomes a tipping point where we've struggled long and hard to just to have our atheist civil rights, but um, I think it's going to become more and more, you know, just, it's, it's just more rational, more logical, you know, than believing in something that, um, you know, I, have, you, have you all, you've probably seen the Kissing Hank's Ass skit. Um, if you haven't, you should. Oh, it's called Kissing Hank's Ass, and it's, it's hilarious. It's it's uh, kind of like two Jehovah Witnesses come to the door and and they say, you know, you have to do all these things, essentially kiss Hank's ass, and then you'll get $10 million when you leave town. And they're talking about, essentially, you know, <laughs> when, when you die, you go to heaven, but 
but there's never there's never a confirmation of that, and that's what this whole skit is about. Like you know, the, the guy's <laughs> questioning the, the people at his door, saying, "Well, has anybody ever come back and told you that they for sure got the ten million dollars?" Like, no, 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 no. That's one of the rules. Once you leave town, you can't you can't come back and tell anyone about it. So, oh wow! <laughs> so yeah, I think more and more people are thinking about it and thinking, wait, there's no evidence and. And so why should I believe this just because my parents do or whatever? So I think times are changing. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And, yeah, the like with the, the whole leadership angle is there's always new people coming up that can be developed. Um, you know, we're, we're in the middle right now of doing some restructuring with TV Core. And one of the goals with that restructuring is to be able to help the groups better develop new leaders because you always need to have people on their way up. Uh, like our, our uh, Secular Student Alliance here had quite the pattern of one great charismatic leader who does amazing things and then graduates mm-hmm. and then it dies. Mm-hmm. And somebody else picks it up and this most recent reboot, uh, they're on a, th- a third president in a row. In one year? In, no, out of it's out of the last three years. Oh, okay. Um, so Jake uh, got it going again. And then Issa took over for a semester. And now Lindy is the, the new president. And they've got four or five officers in line ready to, to become president when she graduates. Great. And uh, the speaker, this uh, last National Day of Reason was mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. And he, he was amazing. Yeah. But, it, you know, it's hard. They're students and, and they graduate. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's just yeah ha- having the people ready to, to move up is that's that's critical you have to like for for students you have to identify freshmen and sophomores that can take over when they're juniors and for the other groups you need to find people that are at just the right point in their life mm-hmm. to be able to step up and and take it on mm-hmm it's it's a thankless job, you know. You work hard, you know, <laughs> and you come under criticism, but hopefully you you get as much uh, gratitude as well. Yeah. Because some people, and you know, it's your volunteer, and some people like to gripe, but I'm hoping you get enough kudos as well. It's, it's they appreciate what you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are. Wow, we are just about to the one hour mark. Oh, that Sweet. went by fast. <laughs> this was this was too yeah. much fun. <laughs> I, I looked over and I was thinking we were probably at about 35, 40 minutes. Nope, nope. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. I, I'm very, very happy that people are out there like you are doing this stuff because nobody else is. Uh, man, you, you're just kind of kicking ass. Are you talking to <laughs> Dustin? No, I'm, screw Dustin, you. <laughs> I, I, you know, thank you, Wesley, but I, I have to be honest. Uh, I've I've totally backed off now, and I'm in the background, and I'm glad to help. But you know, I I am not doing hardly anything more now. Dustin, Lauren, Gary, you know, they're they're doing it, and um, so it. What Dustin was saying is, you, you need leaders coming up, and mm-hmm. and I feel guilty many times because I'm not, I'm not out there writing letters I, i'll see things and that used to be one of my things i would do is write letters to the government officials or to letters to the editor and i just don't do it but when i see a letter you know like you know art often still writes in the mm-hmm. in the nampa paper and i was like yes you know yes someone's out there doing it so i i thank you but i have to admit i'm not doing as much as i should <laughs> anymore <laughs> but with you can only do it for so long. And we have a lot of the same leaders still going. Yeah. Still going. Yeah. You know, Van, Jeanette, Paul, they, they just, they keep going. And I admire that. Yeah. But eventually, <laughs> yeah, everybody needs to know where their limit is. And we don't, if people keep doing it past that burnout point, you get a lot of ineffectual leadership. Yeah. Uh, it's... It takes a lot of, of wisdom and humility to actually be able to take that step back when you need to. <laughs> now I garden, take my frustration out on those weeds. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, for all we know, in a couple of years, you might come back with 
renewed uh, passion knows? and vigor. Who knows? <laughs> or you must, may just enjoy life. I, I just am so glad that we've got leaders like you, and, and I just want to support what you're doing, you know? Um, I think that's what I can do best now is just be supportive and helpful when, when I'm asked because it takes energy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, like one of the, the things we were wanting to have, have you on talk, to talk about is how it was before the modern movement. Yeah. Because uh, there's the, the so-called new atheists, the atheists of the, the internet age, and thought of as being these horrible, <laughs> militant people. No, we just... Well, and... Uh, we have an easier time getting the message out and aren't as afraid. And you know, that that, that really strikes me as strange because um, my first uh, indoctrination, or not, no, my first... Uh, um, Involvement with this was uh, my connection with American Atheists that was founded by Madeline Murray O'Hare, who was known as the most hated woman in America. You'd call her the militant atheist, probably, Mm -hmm. you know. But but when I got involved with that organization, it was so focused on separation of state and church and atheist civil rights. It it wasn't. I mean, I'm sure she did attack religion on, on its own lack of merit, but. Really, I focused on just the government issue. And so it's funny that you say that because it kind of maybe has come full circle. Yeah. You know, if, if you're being accused of being militant, and, and isn't, I've heard things that say just because we speak out, then we're called militant. But, you know, <laughs> the religious yeah. folks, they're speaking out all the time. But when we do it, we're militant. But it's interesting because I learned, you know, I, all the reading I did was the Madeline Marie O'Hare stuff and... I look back and I think some of that was pretty in your face, even though I didn't go there. She did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so, I don't know. I think that we'll be accused of of being evil and bad no matter what we do, just because we exist. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people that call David Silverman, you know, the, the current head of the AA that, uh, He's he's the evil atheist, and then you have those nice, nice, you know, fuzzy atheists on the side that are, you know, basically doing the same thing. But you know, <laughs> yeah, you just need somebody to say like, oh yeah, there's the bad one over there, and then, but these are the good mm-hmm. ones, and you know, they're, they're, I don't know, it's kind of like a little bait and switch thing to me. <laughs> you know, and and you need all kinds, and I, I liked oh, playing. Totally. I liked playing the the good atheist. You know, I, I I still want to get along with everybody, and I have friends that are religious, and so, you know, I I like taking a softer approach with religious people mm-hmm. per se, but the government officials is who I choose to channel my energy toward. But I think it takes all kinds, mm-hmm. and and then yeah, they, they can poke their finger however they want to, but. It takes all kinds to make yeah. to make a difference. You need the soft ones, the hard ones, and whatever. And we need to get as many people speaking out as possible. So mm-hmm. that and and then that that shows who we are. We they, they can't stereotype us. We're all different types of people. Yeah. yeah. And what what Silverman is best at doing is getting in the news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he's figured out how to get uh, ten thousand dollars to get him on the. O'Reilly. 20 million TVs. <laughs> yeah, he he's just got O'Reilly's number. It's awesome. <laughs> All right. So, uh Susan, do you have uh anything you'd like to plug? Um or your your garden maybe? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, grow your own food, eat locally. Yeah, very involved in that, um uh, especially with <laughs> Tim, my husband. Um yeah, we we garden and and very into that whole scene. So, um, yeah, I'm living the life. Awesome. While, while you're out here on the forefront, I'm in the garden. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, eat All a right. tomato for me. All right. Tomatoes are easy, Wesley. <laughs> Other things I can't grow, keep trying, but tomatoes, yes, can grow those. So awesome. I'll, I'll send you some over there in... In rainy Seattle area. Oh, goodness. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Susan, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And, and Wesley, I hope someday to meet you in person. I would love that.
Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.